Hey, Carrie. There we go. Perfect. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh my God, I'm about to throw my computer through the wall. Oh <laughs> it's, it's like it's on its last legs and I cleaned it up today and it gave me a little bit more juice and uh, it's, it's just gives me that, I call it that spinning wheel of death, you know? Yes. And I apologize <laughs> about that. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm trying to move to more light. I didn't realize how much, how dark this office is. Oh, much better. I'm going to press pause. Here we go. So, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Carrie Jones. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is exciting. Yeah. So let me just give you an, introdu an introduction and introduce you to our audience. So Carrie Jones uh, is a passion, has passion and expertise lies in the areas of hormonal, adrenal, and thyroid health. She's recognized, uh, she recognizes that imbalances can occur at any age as the, uh, and, and believes that it is important to look at the big picture, such as the appropriate use of lab testing. Dr. Jones graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and went on to complete her residency in women's health, endocrinology, and, and hormones. Later, she graduated at Grand Canyon University in the Masters of Public Health program with the goal of doing more international work and, and health empowerment. Dr. Jones is an adjunct prof professor at NNUM, NNUNM <laughs> and regularly consults, uh, lectures, and writes on the topics of hormones, thyroids, adrenals, digestive issues, autoimmune, and more, uh, and more both nationally and internationally. She is the medical director of Precision Analytical, uh, the world's leading laboratory in dried urine hormone testing. I think I got through that not too bad. Just Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so that keeps you busy. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now with these days with yourself. Oh my gosh, a lot of lecturing, a lot of educating, a lot of travel. I do a lot of international travel about hormones and uh, I do webinars like this, which is fantastic. I love it to do it with smart doctors like yourself who geek out over this. So right. it's been busy. Oh, awesome. And so yeah. do you enjoy what you do? I love what I do. It's the only thing I know to do. So it's right. a passion of mine. It's really important. A lot of the people that we talk to on our forums, and that's some of the first questions they'll ask me is, you know, what's, what are the first things we can do for the adrenals? And I, I coined, actually, I don't know if you know this. I bought a, um, this is how nerdy I am. I bought a, um, I guess you can get a patent or a trademark on a name. So stress footprint is what I um, trademark because I tell them you need to lower your stress footprint um, mm -hmm. every single day. And that starts with less is more. And that starts with just enjoying what you're doing in life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's really awesome that you do and, and do that as well. Do you, are you doing any research in terms of having publications of your own? Do you, do you do anything like that? Not yet as far as actual publications, but I do a lot of writing. Absolutely. A goal of mine is, you know, eventually to get a um, hormone women's health, men's health kind of book out there. Um, even just on the not on the, not even on the grand plane like published and awesome but even self published just to really help people understand hormones 101 cuz that's that's what i get that's what i understand and that's what i'm passionate about no, that's awesome. So we did, I don't, it was probably about a year ago, you yeah. and I did another uh, a really great uh, webinar. It was on PCOS and really mm -hmm. some of the common myths of, you know, of having to have just polycystic ovaries to be able to be diagnosed as PCOS. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. today, really what I wanted to do was introduce some of the new changes that um, the lab precision analyticals and the Dutch test um, have added. And so the first one I really wanted to talk to you about was um, the, the, cycle, the, the cycle mapping with, uh, mm -hmm. so tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what that is and why that's important for, for women that are having hormonal dysregulation. Well, and actually this one hits close to home because I'm actually in the middle of collecting my cycle map right now. I'm on, I think day 16 or day 17 of collection. So I'm going through the whole thing myself. I always do it first before recommending it to others. Oh, that's cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but what it is, it's, it's instead of just doing your typical one day hormone test, you know, day in the luteal phase, day 19, 20, 21, you will actually urinate on a strip of paper one strip of paper every morning, basically every day of your cycle. And then the lab graphs it out. So what they do is they graph out your estrogen rise and fall, and then they graph out your progesterone, hopefully rise in the luteal phase. And it's an amazing test because 
how many women do you know say, I have symptoms all month long, but I know they're hormonal. Or they'll say, I get symptoms around ovulation and around my cycle. Or, um, you know, I get migraines that seem to correlate with hormones going up and down, or I get weight gain or bloating or anything, or they're just trying to get pregnant. They're trying to get pregnant. They can't get pregnant. They can't figure out their cycle. So when you see it all month long in one big graph, your actual hormones, this isn't, this isn't temperature. This is your actual hormones, man. You can get a lot of really cool information. Awesome. So, so tell us, I know, cause I've done that before for other labs. I, I haven't, you know, full disclosure done that with you guys. Um, yeah. And I do have someone we're, we're working with, so I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I have done them with the saliva, you know, where they do it for the whole month for the saliva. So, so tell us a little bit about the difference of the utility of what you're seeing in the urine that you're not seeing in the saliva. Absolutely. So the great thing about the cycle map is because it's urine, it's, it's not a saliva. It's they'll, they'll urinate on the little strip of paper every morning, which many women find pretty easy because they just have to pee on a strip and let it dry versus having to collect um, saliva in the tube. But we add on um, at the end of the whole month, we do add on what's called the Dutch complete, where they get all the cool phase one, phase two estrogen detoxification metabolites. So not only do you get to see your estrogen rise and fall in the month, you also get to see how it's going through your liver. Is it going the right pathway? Is it, is it stuck? Is it building up? And then on top of that, you get to see your testosterone and your DHEA um, pathways. So again, like in our old um, podcast that we did, we talked about PCOS and the different pathways that give hair growth on your face and hair loss on your head and mood swings like anger. And so we look at those pathways too. And then you get all the, you know, all the cortisol stuff. So you can say, you know, I know you're getting migraines or I know you're trying to get pregnant or I know you're having these symptoms. And oh, by the way, here's, here's your whole adrenal picture because stress footprint, it makes a huge impact on our hormones, right? Right. Awesome. So, and like you were saying too, um, you know, we, we have the pathway be planner behind us. My and favorite. So when you have a saliva test, you're not looking at those phase one, phase two enzymes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can see where the pathway breaks down mm -hmm. and, and what you can do about it and what the numbers are telling you in real time. So right. I think that's the benefit too. And also, I don't know, like, you know, saliva, where's the aha moment for me one time was the saliva represents one to 2% of the total, you know, the, to the free, the free fraction of the hormone. Right. Whereas, you know, your metabolized cortisol, what could, I don't know, is what 95, 96% of the yeah, And depending on the, yeah, depending on the, the literature can be, it's 80% plus is what we say. 80% yep. plus. Okay. Yep. So it gives you an idea of how much cortisol can you make? What's your potential? Can you make it or not? And then the free is how much is free and active. So you may have nothing free, very low levels of free, but you actually have a whole lot of cortisol in total. So it's like, where's right. it going, right? It's to, to, to figure out the big picture. Yeah. And let's talk, let's maybe talk about that. Cause I do get a lot of those questions carry on. Hey, I, I have already done the Dutch and mm -hmm. my free was really high, but my metabolize was very low. Right. But vice versa. My metabolize was very high or my free was very low. So right. you can give us some expertise on why it would be high free and low total metabolized. Great question. The absolute number one reason is a thyroid problem. So the thyroid, when the thyroid slows down, or if you cannot get your T3 into the cells, more of a cellular hypothyroid look, yeah. you know, the thyroid will slow everything down. It slows down your metabolism. It slows down your hair growth. It slows down your gut. Now you have constipation. It'll slow down your production of cortisol and it will slow down your metabolism of cortisol. So you get really low metabolized cortisol. And then what happens is the free cortisol goes, well, I have nowhere to go. I can't get metabolized out everything slowed down. So I'm just going to spin and spin and spin. And so it shows up as free on the Dutch test. It just gets urinated out. So check thyroid if you see that pattern. Yeah. You know, I did a, um, a, a webinar with Dr. Eric Balkovich and uh, he was talking, you know, it was the, I don't, I'm sure you're aware of it. He, you know, it was a, it was a couple notes for me too, where he looks at the total T3 to the reverse T3 mm -hmm. and then the, you know, the free T3 to the reverse T3 and the numbers he's quoted is 
total T3 to reverse T3 greater than 10, and then um, free T3 um, divided, by, divided by reverse T3 greater than 0.2. And if those numbers are low, it's exactly what you were saying where mm -hmm. that cellular hypothyroidism, where it's not a glandular problem per se, it's the, there's, not, there's no active hormone inside the cell being mm -hmm. able to utilize that free, and, and then it goes really, really high. And, and you see this in patients, right? You get a TSH level that's normal, but yet they have all the symptoms, all the symptoms. And you're thinking, they look really hypothyroid to me. It's the, the TSH is just a marker of T3 in the brain, in the pituitary. It doesn't take into account anything that's happening in your tissue. So if your hair is falling out, it's not looking at your hair cells. If you're, if you're constipated, it's not looking at your GI cells to see if you can get T3 in there. And so that's the big difference. And it shows up on the Dutch test. We see... Um, that cellular where it can't get in the cells uh, all the time. We see the pattern constantly. So, so then on the flip side, what would you see with the high metabolized and the low free, the low, uh, yeah, free? Low free. So if metabolized cortisol is high, that it means either it's, it's upregulated being made, something is you know, telling the body make tons of cortisol in total, and then the liver is processing it really quickly. So the most common reasons are, are fight or flight. Um, pain infection, inflammation, um, insulin resistance, um, obesity, fat tissue can make its own cortisol, hyperthyroidism, anything that pushes the gas pedal as opposed to the brake will speed up that metabolized cortisol. And then what happens is your metabolized cortisol, your metabolism goes up, so your free cortisol goes down. It's getting metabolized quite quickly. Right. Now, the other, the other thing that people forget about is that cortisol rides around on a binding protein on a bus. And so just like with thyroid, with, with uh, thyroid binding globulin, just like with testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, you may have too high levels of your binding globulin, your cortisol binding globulin. So sometimes I'll send people back and say, hey, go get more blood work, check your cortisol binding globulin, and let's see if that's the cause of your low free cortisol. And the number one reason for that people forget about is high estrogen. And how many estrogen dominant people do we see? all the time. Right. So as far as back to the cycle mapping though, so what about, cause if you, you know, well, the, the double, double question, women that aren't having their cycle, so they don't really know why, mm -hmm. you know, when the start date is. Um, so would that be recommended for them and what utility would you get out of it by doing the cycle mapping? It depends why, it depends why, the, why they don't have a cycle. So if this is a woman who maybe has the Marina IUD or uh, the Skyla IUD, or maybe she's had an ablation or a partial hysterectomy, so she still has her ovaries, but she's just not bleeding anymore, great, great utility, because you can do the Dutch test and we just graph it out for you since you still, you still cycle, your ovaries still work, you just don't bleed. Um, but if you have like a menopausal woman, she doesn't have a cycle because she's menopausal, not very helpful because menopausal, fully menopausal, through menopause, generally have pretty low, pretty constant-ish hormones. Um, so it, you, you got to take some history. You got to figure out, like, why, why aren't you bleeding? If, right. she's ir if she's irregular, let's say she's trying to get pregnant, but she has PCOS and she's irregular, very helpful then too, because we can still graph out and see, do you get any rise and fall? Do you get anything that happens and try to act on that? So what would be the start date then if they're not really sure when their cycle would, you know, would start for the ones that are yes. of the, the younger age that are still, you know, not in, pre, in menopause? So they have a couple options. One is they can just start anytime. So they'll, they'll start. Let me back up. If they don't have, if they have irregular cycles, so they don't know where they're starting, they can either wait for their next period and then collect, start collecting, or just start collecting and see when their next period comes. The other option is to do an ovulation predictor kit. So go to the pharmacy or the grocery store and buy those ovulation predictor kits. And when it's positive, you know you're roughly around ovulation. So you would start collecting from there, knowing that's ovulation and you would go forward about 30, 35 days because you would know in there you would cycle, but you're not bleeding, like if you had a ablation or uh, the Marina IUD. And so, but we graph it out either way. So we can at least see if you have a rise and fall. So there's a couple of options. So how, how many test strips do you include then in, in that cycle mapping then? 
A lot. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Right. There's uh, 20, 20 some, I want to say, and then you have the four at the end if you add on the uh, adrenal portion and the metabolites portion. Okay. So the complete, we had four more at the end. Okay. And then as far as um, with the information now, so now you're finding different patterns of, of different, you know, different uh, rise and falls, mm -hmm. shortness, length. Um, so what are some of the most common things that you're seeing and what can be done about those things? Absolutely. I'd say the number one thing that I see is that people's progesterone falls off short, meaning they ovulate they make progesterone, but instead of being this nice, healthy, robust curve, it kind of goes up and then and it falls down. And so we, when we graph it out, we can see, oh, yeah, you have good progesterone for a couple of days, but then it crashes. And that's when they say, I have PMS, I'm, uh, my breasts are tender, I, or my periods are heavy, or um, you know, I'm really moody, or I get migraines. Now, the other thing we will see is that estrogen. We will see estrogen rise too much. Um, or we'll kind of do this up and down sort of um, uh, sort of jigsaw pattern, you know, just sort of goes like that. And, and then the women will say that. They're like, I feel that. I feel one day this way, the next day this way. As I get close to my period, I feel a certain way. And when we graph it out in this big picture, it's literally a big graph that you look at. You can go, yeah, yeah, I, I feel that on that day. That's when it started. Yeah, that's how I feel towards the end of my cycle. Or yeah, that's how I feel at ovulation. I feel terrible. And so then we can address it with, you know, vitamins and supplements and, and herbs and diet and, and things like that to say, okay, let's try to get your, your hormones back on track. Okay. So, so a couple, um, I fire, I'm like, my brain's going off, off. Like, no, I love it. Go for it. I'm ready. So as far as I know that, what are the recommendations for, I mean, these women that aren't, aren't doing well with their cycles, they're on hormones. So how are you recommending to um, do the test? you know, in lieu of the fact that they're doing the hormones, how to, what are the recommendations? We for don't, we actually don't recommend. So if they're on any kind of hormone, the cycle mapping will probably not be ideal for them. So especially, um, you know, even synthetic. So women will go on the birth control pill, but still have hormonal symptoms. Um, uh, the birth control pill shuts down the the brain to ovary communication, the HPO access. And so our test only looks at the kind of hormone that's real. Either you make it or a bioidentical hormone. It doesn't pick up the birth control pill. So we don't recommend it for the pill. And then if you're on, um, let's say you're on progesterone, you're a woman and you're, you've got symptoms and you're, you take progesterone in the second half of your cycle. What it will do is it will make it look super elevated because you, you take it every day, especially oral progesterone, which is quite common or sublingual where you, you know, you stuck on it or um, have little drops that you let dissolve. So we do highly recommend if you're on hormones, not to do the cycle mapping. Actually, it's best, best as a baseline. So how long would they be off of it if they say, well, I just really want to do it. How long do I need to be off of progesterone for me to find out what, what's going on? Because I've been on progesterone. It's not working. My cycle's still messed up. I want to see what's going on. So they just stop it right away. So they, let's say, let's say they come see you and they're, they're like, Hey, my period's going to start this weekend, but I'm taking progesterone. What do I do? You would say, take your progesterone until you get your period, stop the progesterone. Don't restart it and start the cycle mapping. It's that right. quick. Okay. okay awesome. Quick. You don't and have to wait months. Now with a birth control pill, they have to wait months. So if a patient comes to you and says, I'm on the birth control pill, but I want to go off of it to test my real hormones. They have to go off the birth control pill and have three periods, three, and then they can test. So it's okay. a long time with the birth right. control pill. Mm -hmm. and, in the, and the reason for that is the pill is so influential. It's so suppressive. So we have to wait for it to wear off the brain. Gotcha. Okay. And then what about like thyroid hormone? What would they be doing? What would be the recommendation on that? Stay on it like normal. Don't stop. Don't change. Okay, good. Because I don't know. Someone said that they said they were recommended two weeks before. And she said, if I'm off my thyroid hormone for two no. weeks, well, you know. No. Okay. I could see if somebody said um, like supplements, not the medication, but you know, sometimes people are on zinc or selenium or, or herbs for thyroid and they'll go, um, I want to know baseline. Baseline, what are, what are my adrenals and my hormones without this stuff? Sure. Then you'll have to stop your herbs and your nutrients right. um, for a couple of weeks, but medication do not stop. Mm-mm. 
Okay. Yeah. And then so, so cycling, cyc excuse the pun, cycling back to the original <laughs> um, things that we were talking about, you were mentioning that the two major patterns would be sort of the progesterone kind of goes and then just drops mm -hmm. and then the estrogen is all over the place. Right. So what would be some of the things you're seeing why that progesterone is doing that? in terms of falling and just dropping just dropping off you know honestly i think it's a combination which we've touched on already i think a combination of stress of diet of environmental influencers chemicals toxicants things like that it's just that when the body makes progesterone it it makes it out of the tissue that's left over when you make an egg so you ovulate you release an egg and this tissue left over is called a corpus luteum or corpus luteum and that's what makes progesterone and if it's not strong if you if, if it's not healthy if it's um been exposed to stuff then it's not going to have the oomph and the muscle to make progesterone for you so you'll make it maybe and then it'll it'll crash and burn early so believe it or not, I think a lot of lifestyle factors play a role. I think thyroid plays a role. I think stress plays a role. All things that are modifiable. Thank you. Sure. Absorption and, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, bioflow and, and then, of course, the mm -hmm. genetics and the super sort yes. of, yes. you know, that storm. So then as far as I, I would imagine the same answer then in terms of the estrogen going all over the place yes. as well. Same thing. I think it's the exact same thing. I think... You just, you know, with, with genetics, with liver, with environment, with diet, with lifestyle, it's just, we can't, we can't make the progesterone and we can't process the estrogen and it just becomes a mess. Okay. And so where does now sort of the, the adrenals, which, which I know when now you have that complete, the Dutch complete at the end. Um, and now we're seeing some phase one metabolites being upregulated or downregulated or five alpha for, you know, you know, mm -hmm. is is high and they're, they're aromatizing or they have insulin resistance or mm -hmm. they have, you know, very high free and they're, and they're, you know, metabolized, which we talked about as low. I mean, all these patterns are showing up, but right. how, how is sort of that, how is it being rounded off, so to speak, by that Dutch complete now? So it just goes to show bigger, more to the story, right? More to the picture. So just everything you said, if your metabolized is high, your five alpha is high. So for people who don't know, the five alpha is the pathway that causes the anger, the irritation, the hair growth in places we don't want it, um, the hair loss on the head. Um, if they're over aromatizing, they're converting from testosterone too much into estrogen. All of those have the same reasons. One is genetics, two is stress, three is inflammation, and four is blood sugar and insulin problems. And it's the same things I think that are affecting the health of the corpus luteum and the ability of your liver, of course, to detox, to get the estrogen out. So genetics, blood sugar, inflammation, and cortisol stress. And, and along with cortisol is, is adrenaline, right? Norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, which doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but huge players. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we talk about that too with, you know, so actually good segue. So <laughs> now you guys have brought on the organic acid tests. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not a complete profile. I mean, it no. has, you know, the, what the HVA, the VMA and mm -hmm. um, some of the, yeah. and we have then six markers, the B12, B6. Yep. And uh, pyroglutamate. So glutathione. Okay. Okay. So awesome. So, so for, for those, like what, what on earth does that mean now for some people where, um, you know, where they have the concern of, of aromatization, mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of anxiety um, and, and now potentially the gut's not doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So what utility does that bring to the game now? Huge. It's, it's great because the, the six markers that we chose specifically line up, give you more information about the Dutch test. Um, so for as an example, I just said norepinephrine and epinephrine or noradrenaline and adrenaline. So that's a VMA marker. And, and when your VMA is elevated, one of the reasons could be that you're running in fight or flight all the time. And if you're running in fight or flight all the time, which you know, and your listeners know, then um, I read this super great quote where it says norepinephrine is damaging because it directs away from repair maintenance, regeneration, and reproduction, and towards things to stimulate, to move you, to get you to like run from the tiger, except we're not running anymore, right? I mean, not usually. We don't really have tigers and, you know, lions and bears. Oh my, we have bills and we have jobs and we have kids and we have social media and we have politics and things that don't require running. 
but yet we get that same damage and we don't, we lose out on our reproduction or reproductive hormones. We can't repair. So we have more autoimmune. We can't maintain, we get worse. I mean, it's just, and it's all ties back to stress. It all ties back to adrenaline. Just on that one marker, it can give you that much information. Right. Okay. And then, and then as far as the other markers, like the, the five HIA and the, mm-hmm. and the, and the H, what would we say? The HVA. Mm-hmm. So, yep. so those are just sort of giving us a further picture on yep. sort of mood, right. and inhibitory stuff. Yep. You got it. You got it. And then of course we have the nutrients, like you said, so we have the B12 and the B6 and the glutathione marker, which tie in really well. Obviously the B6 and B12 are used for lots of things in the body, but on our test in particular, detox. So you are a man or a woman and you have a lot of estrogen in your body and you're looking at your estrogen liver detox. Well, B12, B6 and glutathione play a huge role. So if you are estrogen dominant, male or female, maybe you have low B12, maybe you have low B6, maybe your glutathione is being used up. And, and, and now you can put the picture together like, oh, or put the picture together more. I'm not saying it's a complete picture, but right. more like, oh, I can't get my estrogens out because I don't have enough B12. Okay. Oh, my B6 is low. Oh, I'm, my glutathione is getting all used up or can't recycle or what have you. So um, you just get more information. So, so what would that show as high markers um, for deficiencies like the typical organic acids? It does. So the B12 marker, if it, it's um, methylmalonate, MMA, if it's high, and then the B6 marker is crazy named. It's called xanthurinate with an X. And then the glutathione marker, pyroglutamate, it's actually if it's high or low. High or low means it's a glutathione problem, right? You can't make it. You, you're using it up. You can't recycle it. Right. And same yeah. thing for the other markers, B12 and B6, or just when it's high, it's deficient? Just when they're high. Just when they're high. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I noticed you guys, like every time like I get a new report, it's like, oh, there's something new on there. That I, like, <laughs> where did that come from? But, you know, I noticed that you have um, on the phase one where, you know, I always, I, I joke around, these are bad analogies, but I say phase one is sort of like the garbage man bringing the garbage to the curb. Mm-hmm. Phase two is the garbage man taking it away. And usually that phase one is sped up. And, you know, if you have garbage more accumulating at the curb, that's not being taken away. It starts to stink up the neighborhood. Same things for ourselves. But yes. you guys changed the ratios a little bit. It went a little bit higher. Well, what we did is we actually opened them up to be the full bell curve. So before we had um, ideals, right? We had the 16 OH, we wanted 20% or less. We wanted the 2 OH, 70% or higher. And now we actually have the, you know, within a standard deviation I think one standard, maybe two standard deviations. We have the, the full range because what was happening was people said, oh my gosh, my 16 OH is at 21% and 20 is the cutoff. I'm going to die. I'm like, no, no, actually, right, right. You know, it's, a, it's a little wider than that. It's just, we gotcha. get it. That's why you did that. So, yeah. so what do you see mostly? I mean, I see, you see a array of stuff, but do you see mostly fast phase one and slow phase two because of methylation and, and so forth? Or do you see a little bit of both? We see a little bit of both. We see a little bit of both. We definitely see slow phase two. Absolutely. I, hands down. Um, but we see a mix in phase one. I'll see very slow phase one. I'll see a lot of 4-OH, which is the naughty pathway um, high, or I'll see, I'll see really fast phase one, I'll see all these red arrows in the high marker, and then phase two can't keep up. You don't have enough, you know, garbage trucks to take them away. <laughs> so what I really like about though, the last page, which was like caveman and a fire is like, oh my God, there's this whole thing now on that last page of the report, which, it, or I don't know if it's the last page, but it shows you, you know, what will speed up something if it's slow or what will slow mm-hmm. down something if it's fast. So it gives you great recommendations. So mm-hmm. I guess what would be some, you know, just sort of women want to watch this and get some good information about um, they're really inflamed. They have insulin resistance. Um, they may be aromatizing. Um, they're slow with their phase two, you know, methylation. They all have mm-hmm. MTHFR and other stuff. Right. So what Come. are some of the things that you're recommending on that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously all the modifiable things that I'm sure you talk to your patients about, of course, you know, obviously diet and sleep, um, super critical, but as far as supplements, like what can I take? So phase two, um, you mentioned MTHFR and MTHFR is a part of phase two, but really it's the other gene comp C O M T. Right. Right. And, and it's, a it's the M is a methyl transferase. So you need things that have methyl in them. So methyl B12, methyl B6, trimethylglycine, um, 
choline, which doesn't say methyl, but choline is helpful. Um, SAMe, the M in SAMe is, you know, methyl. And so it's these methyl movers are what build up your garbage trucks so that you can get all the trash out. And so right. when people say, what should I do for my estrogen? I'm like, you know what, believe it or not, if you can get that phase two moving better, uh, it'll, it'll really help that phase one, no matter what, because you'll just clear the trash, clear the trash. On movers, you got to be careful with, because some women will go overboard on phase one and forget about phase two, men too. And, and now they have all this phase one floating around, all this trash right at the street. And they think they're doing good for themselves, but they forgot to increase the amount of garbage trucks. Yeah. So the most common thing I'll see all the time for phase one is like the supplement DIM. I'm sure you see the diendol methane DIM, which is in, right. um, you know, your broccoli family, broccoli, kale, cauliflower. So right. women will dose up, dose up, dose up. And they're like, but I don't feel any better. I'm like, I know you've just put a whole lot of trash on the street and you've no you're gonna start. You're <laughs> going to start using that. You're allowed to. I'd be very honored if you do. So that's very well, good. Funny enough, my analogy, my analogy is the bathtub. I haven't used the trash. So I always say phase one is, the, is your water coming into your bathtub. And phase two is the ability of your drain. Right. Okay. So phase one is yeah. how fast is your water coming in? What kind of water is coming in? Is it two water? Is it four water? Is it 16 water? Right. And then your drain is your phase two. Is your drain open? Is it clogged? Is it open enough? So that's the analogy that I always no, use. I like but it I'm too. Loving that's the great. trash can. I'm no, on that's, it. <laughs> that's good. We can share. I'm, I'm, you know, it's a, right. we share. It. So as far as the, now the, the cortisol awakening response, cause I think that's really yeah. awesome too. I haven't used that either. I gotta be honest. And so, um, yeah. I learned about that a while ago and I do sort of implement, you know, in the morning people doing some, some kind of high intensity at low, you know, low intervals, just to, if they have a really flat curve, but how are you guys, is the saliva through you guys are doing that through? It is. Yeah. It is. So here's why. So first of all, people go, I thought you were a urine company. Why do you use saliva? Well, so the cortisol awakening response is literally the first hour of your day when you are asleep. Your, your brain is telling your adrenals like, okay, he's going to wake up soon. Let's start in your eye. It takes off and your cortisol is supposed to shoot way up in the first 30 minutes, if not 60 minutes. So if it doesn't, if you don't go up high enough, you're usually pretty tired. And if you go too high, if you overshoot the moon, you're usually anxious or have panic or other issues. And so it's this nice little balance because we have to get a, a right when your eyes open 30 minutes later, 60 minutes later, it had to be saliva. So we have these little swabs that you put in your mouth and you, you just suck on and then stick back on the tube. Um, so it, it, most people can't urinate three times in 60 minutes. And uh, most people don't want their blood drawn three times in 60 minutes. And so we opted for these little cotton swabs just to make it as easy as possible. So, so are, are people using that as is, or are they using that with the Dutch Complete? It go, it's called the Dutch Plus. And so it's the Complete plus these cotton swabs um, that you do in addition. So it's, it's all the dried urine, everything is there, all the same metabolites, everything. But in addition, you add in these saliva markers. To, so you get more, it's more collection, but it's more data. And right. the whole point of the Plus is to zoom in on the morning. So when you have people who say, my morning is the worst time, I can't get out of bed, I hit snooze a million times, I need 16 cups of coffee, or I wake up in the morning massively anxious, I wake up in panic attack, I wake up with depression, the, the first 60 minutes of their day are the worst, that's when it's really helpful to just zoom right in and we check it every 30 minutes to see what's up. We're cool. Do you ever do that like on third shift workers at different times to see if their circadian rhythms all backwards? Yep. Yep. And we just tell third shift workers, follow your schedule. You know, the, the instructions will say, you know, you try, you know, morning and 30 minutes and 60 minutes. But if, you know, a third shift workers morning might be in the afternoon. So I'll say right. just do it on your schedule. Don't do it on our schedule. That's awesome. So what mm -hmm. secrets do you have in terms of other stuff that are coming through the pike that you can sort of give us the IPO information on? What's going on there? We in uh, right now we are actually working on uh, somewhere between five or seven more organic acid markers. So we're going to have a little bit bigger panel all related to the Dutch um, and uh, to give you more information. So we have this first set of six that are out right now. And then right. we're looking later, you know, in the year to add even add on even more to it just to give you more information and more answers. 
Cool. And then, and then just sort of tracking back, you mentioned that one of the reasons for that five alpha enzyme being upregulated would be genetics. What, what SNPs are you seeing that are related to that being more upregulated besides insulin resistance and inflammation? What well, would be, ac yeah. actually, if you think about it, um, so the, with the five alpha reductase, if, um, if, if, if stress in estrogen or not estrogen, if stress is a, and cortisol is a, is a reason to upregulate that 5-alpha. So I start to look at the, the same genes that break down norepinephrine, epinephrine, right, Compt and MAO. So I'm looking at them. So they're not direct to the 5-alpha, but they right. are definitely, if you have Compt and MAO and you're an anxious right. person and a stressed person, right. which means it hangs out longer in your body than the average bear, then right. your 5-alpha may also be higher as an indirect result also. Okay, great. That's awesome. I guess the, the last question I would ask, because I could, I want to be respectful for your time, but I could keep going on for on, on and on. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Um, so, so I'm doing, you know, both, all three, blood, urine, and I actually, I'm sorry, I wanted to get with you to go over one of those cases, but. Oh yeah, um, I wrote you back. Yeah, you did. And I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, you know, what I find a lot is that the, the, the blood values are, are either normal or really low. Mm -hmm. And then the, the metabolized or the urine values are super, super high. And so, you know, and I, and then what the doctors will typically say, the traditional doctors will say, Oh, I don't care about the urine. That's not established. And you know, saliva. Mm -hmm. So and I'm just going off of the blood and that's all we do. And let's, let's yell at that deaf person a little louder and see if that, you know, that <laughs> you know, finally gets heard. So they take more. So what, what would be sort of with your expertise? Why, why would that be happening for, for these women? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, with any testing, you're just looking at a, a piece of the puzzle. There's there's no, even the Dutch tests, and I'm the medical director for it. There's no perfect test out there. And it has a lot to do with, you know, like clearance rates and detoxification rates and, and binding globulins in the body. So what's in circulation and what's getting cleared may be a little bit different. It depends if they do it on different times of the day. So sometimes people will do the Dutch test and we pull hormone off every single collection you do. So when you do it four times in the day, we pull hormone off of all four markers. Whereas the blood is just a single spot test. So if you got estrogen drawn in the morning and it happened to be low or high, and but you do a Dutch test on the same exact day and maybe your estrogen does rise up, it just takes a little while to get going. We're pulling it off for, so you'll get like an through the day average will be your estrogen as opposed to that one blood draw when you went at nine in the morning to get your estrogen drawn. Same for testosterone. Sometimes people forget they're supposed to get testosterone. Men are supposed to get their testosterone drawn really early in the morning. And so they'll go in the afternoon and they're like, oh, I have low testosterone. I'm like, well, no, it's, you're technically supposed to do it, you know, before eight. Um, right. And which is why in the Dutch test with men and testosterone, we pull it off the morning, the waking sample. And so, it, it, so a lot of this comes into play, right? It comes in like, when do they do it? What part of the cycle? Was it the same day? How's their detox in general? What are they taking? Um, if they're taking a lot of oral hormone, it goes through first pass, first pass gets kicked out into the, into the kidneys and shows up, of course, high on the urine test. The body's, the liver is literally clearing 50 plus percent out of the body. So it, it definitely, we try to get a lot of that backstory so we can figure out like what's going on. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And you guys really do a great job too when you get the backstory on the back page and they fill out, you know, the questionnaires and it reflects mm -hmm. in the report. So awesome job. I, I'm really grateful. You, you <laughs> know, we're friends and I can use you for your mm -hmm. information and you can use my analogies and I really appreciate you giving me the time um, to share with us and uh, and really appreciate the the precision analyticals awesome awesome lab I you know I used to do like I said saliva testing and I would see that the free fraction would be high and then I would give them something to lower it and then of course then when I first did my first test through Dutch while ago and then I would see oh my goodness metabolized cortisol is low on some people that have high and then I'm only making it lower and I'm really not going after the why and the inflammatory response and the stressors and everything else so you it's an awesome test and I really appreciate you guys and you sharing your time with me tonight I, I really thank you for that Hey, I appreciate it. Anytime. Absolutely. You know yeah. that. <laughs> well, no, that's really, what we'll do is um, I, I would love to do like maybe sort of like a, a case fa a case review mm -hmm. with most women because, you know, they're on the synthetics. I, I was talking to a lady the other day and she was on 19 years of Premarin and it's just like, who knows, you know, all the impact wow. that has. And I know you've also mentioned too, like with women and uh, 
and having, you know, the spiral naloxone and the Accutanes mm -hmm. and the men with the, um, with taking some of the, the hair and the finasteride and stuff like that. But, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you're seeing a lot of um, issues with that on the Dutch. Those the Dutch is able to pick that up. Yeah, and unfortunately, well, when we do pick it up, but we may not realize it until after the fact if the person didn't write it down. Um, but what happens is often we'll see some crazy looking results. We'll talk to the doctor, or or sometimes the patient will write it down. I'm taking Accutane, and then um, for you know those who are interested, Accutane can have. Um, pretty damaging effects on cells in the, in the hypothalamus in the brain. And if your hypothalamus is damaged, then it can't talk to the pituitary, which means it can't talk to everything downstream, your ovaries, your testes, your adrenals. And I hear it, the more and more and more I talk about Accutane, the more times people say to me, patients or practitioners, oh my gosh, I did Accutane as a teenager or as in college, I did two rounds, I did three rounds, and I've never been well since. Or I noticed my symptoms happen then, but I couldn't put it together. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, you know, they have no issue. And sometimes it can be pretty, you know, we see it. They're on Accutane. The Dutch test looks terrible. They go off Accutane. They rebound, thankfully. Yeah. What's so, your, in part, what's, what, what's your favorite pituitary, um, whether it be a, a, you know, herbal or it be a, um, homeopathic remedy or something that will really support it because usually you know with you know ovaries and adrenals and thyroid and that all those axi mm -hmm. is it axi or is it axis is which one is it is it you know axes axes axes, axes? multiple axes <laughs> yeah, with, with, what would you know the pituitary is just beat down mm -hmm. so what do you what do you like to recommend for for that my go-to favorite is cordyceps Cordyceps, okay, right, right. I absolutely love the mushroom, right? The mushroom yeah. cordyceps. Yeah. Um, man, it's one of my favorites. So, and it can yeah. be real helpful for the pituitary, um, the adrenals, the immune system, reproduction. So it's kind of multifaceted, but particularly the pituitary. It's amazing how it sort of gets back into food, doesn't it? It gets into sort of the super mm -hmm. healing powers of food. Well, Carrie, I really appreciate mm -hmm. you being here today. Um, I, I thank you so much, and I look forward to our next time, and have an awesome year, and, and make sure you chill out and relax and take time to smell <laughs> the roses as well. So, Absolutely. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate right. it. Thank you so much. All right.